put too much sugar lull on me. You cut to the cake. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking. Oh. I did not drive that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last time on Act 250 Side by Side, we left off at the end, we ended interstate interchanges by defaulting, we're, we're, we're keeping your bill. So that I think brings us to floodways. Floodways is next on page six. <coughs> This one's an easy one for me because I was the state program manager and national fund insurance program coordinator for the state and ran the, you know, um, managed all the criterion 1D, managed all the criterion 1D dealing with floodways uh, and Act 250 projects that would uh, arise. And the, the recommendations here that we have is the same in both. Um, both the joint and our language, and it clarifies what's in current practice now. So I think this is an easy one to support. It's already, it, right now, the language is very archaic, using terminology that we don't use anymore. So it's, a, it's an easy one to, and that has been supported through court cases. So we have a number of court cases that have substantiated um, this role. So this one's an easy one for me, because it provides clarity. Okay, so I think that's, um, yeah. Okay. And, and then it'll just come down to how we end up with criteria one. So they didn't add another, we, we separated and they lumped, is that right? Yeah, so your, your uh, committee bill um, separates AIR into its own criteria, uh, into its own criterion one, and then it rearranges the water so that all of criterion two is now water pollution, and then the existing two and three are merged into one. So you still have substance. You're not um, taking out any substance. You're just sort of rearranging it. So one is air, two is water, and so is three. It's also water. So I, for what's worth, would say we should stay with our committee structure mm -hmm. for now. If we find a reason not to, we'll reconsider. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd like that. All right. Yeah. I, I, and, and, and when we do start wordsmithing it, I think we want to include inundation as an additional uh, to fluvial erosion. But that'll be then, not now. Wordsmith later. Yep. Um, okay. Next. Um, so the joint proposal also contains language um, about the rivers program. Mm -hmm. um, I don't. I don't know. I don't know if you consider this separate or. Or, but there isn't anything in your bill related to this. Um, this is establishing. Um, a new permit system to designate highest priority river corridors. And it, as I understand, this is in lieu of establishing the, uh, this whole section is in lieu of establishing river corridors as a critical resource area. It's a more practical approach to be able to help prioritize and focus on projects that may have an impact on river corridors. So unlike designated under a critical resource area, which our initial bill had. This is to pull it out and manage it in this way. We're already, the state is undergoing that mapping exercise with support from um, the federal government to identify, help identify high priority river corridors for this work. So it's, it's all about flood resilience and flood, um, minimizing flood vulnerability to communities. So this is, a, I support this. I have a question about um, CLF testimony that we just heard about rulemaking. And I know um, Sandy said she'd come back with the, the sections she was specifically referring to, but this 
starts out with rulemaking. And I'm wondering if that testimony, if, does this relate to that, do you think? I she had concerns about the broad rulemaking authority that was in some of the joint proposals. Um, the, Says this topic has been in front of the agency of natural resources for many, many years. It's how do we manage um, development that could be on, on <coughs> floodplains or river corridors that not only you putting people in harm's way or that development in harm's way from flooding, you're also putting the cost of recovery on the backs of taxpayers. Uh, and you're affecting everyone downstream. So if a, a, a flood disaster causes damage at one property, it could have a downstream impact. So there has been an interest from everyone to think differently about how do we manage river quarters and maybe it needs it to go undergo a separate permit process. And that's what this whole rulemaking is about. How do we be smarter at, at um, projects that come up that may be um, having an impact on river quarters. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm excited to see this play out. Um, it will take resources, but it's part of the joint, um, the joint proposal. And I, it's um, an exciting opportunity for the state to really be thinking differently about um, how to better manage our rivers and floodplains. And let's face it, other states have already moved that to this direction where they're providing greater um, protections on, um, in management along, along our riverways. So I, I think if we're moving and trying to keep us safe from extreme weather events um, and minimize impact downstream, this is the an exciting way to go, in my mind. Um, so I will say, so I pulled up Sandy's testimony. I'm sorry, I don't remember specifically what she said. However, I will say that on page 15 of the joint proposal, they, the joint proposal amends section 6025, which is the um, general Act 250 rulemaking section in the statute. And so um, they, there is new language that says the board may adopt rules of procedure for the administration of this chapter. When adopting rules of procedure under this subsection, the board shall make reasonable efforts that processes that that the processes maximize pro se participation. So, Sandy's testimony, and I'm she's not here. Is she? Uh, I I don't remember specifically what she referred to, but that is a change, slightly from what is existing language. So, um, I don't I don't know if she's referring to rulemaking under the board in general or in response to one of these specific programs. What were you just reading? I'm on page 15 of the joint proposal. Um, it's their amendment to 6,025. And I can possibly pull it up if I have internet access. Um, it's on page 15 of the bill. No, it's in the... I guess what I'm, I'd like to understand what this language is trying to do. And I don't know. If mm -hmm. so, so it's page 15 of our comparison? No, no. It, is, it is just in their language. I don't have it anywhere in your language, and I don't, it's, it's, up, on the, it's up on the screen. Oh, there, there, 1.1. Oh, okay. Jamie, I'm wondering if you could help us out again. Or if somebody from the joint proposal world could help us out. Could you go back? I'm sorry, Billy Coster, do you want to go back to your, which page of the side by side are you on? We're on page 15 of your language. We're not, yeah. Right now. 
So I, I think probably they are they are trying to this language was trying to get at how how you account for the pro se when you have taken away the district commissions, but I don't actually know if that's what Sandy was talking about. Yeah, so again, Billy Coster, the language that's on your screen right now is intended to capture the concept that has been discussed at length here that um, we want we want the Enhanced Natural Resources Board to be accessible for non-represented pro se citizens, and it's an effort to ensure that any rulemaking around the procedures of that board is cognizant of that and explicitly considers it. Um, I think as Mr. Groverman testified yesterday, we are certainly open to expanding this language to make it abundantly clear and put specific prescriptions around how that would be done, but that's the intent of this language. I believe what Ms. Levine was speaking to comes later in the document. I was just trying to find it. That's why I wasn't paying attention. But it talks about specific rules of procedure related to how um, minors and majors are determined, whether there can be the waiving of advance notices for projects of a certain scale, things of that nature. I think that's down in the board section. Um, I'm sure Ellen could find it, but I think <coughs> I'm fairly certain that's what Sandy was referring to. So, um, for for this um, for this proposal from the the joint proposal um, about so it's, it's subsection seven five four rivers program flood hazard area rules. Um, I'm I'm in total concurrence. Uh, this is uh, this does this is highly needed. We need to better understand how how to continue our our I think maybe even fairly new level management of river corridors uh, versus what we used to think of rivers as and I also like that that um, this really puts sideboards on our on on our uh, you see there's nothing on the other side of this and that that's because it doesn't necessarily show that it's trying to deal with our critical resource areas per se, but I, think, but, it, but I think it really does, and it puts sideboards on our critical resource areas, um, at least as far as waterways are concerned. And, and that was a huge problem for a lot of people uh, last year, like, what does this really mean? Um, uh, so I, I, I like it, and I'm not, and uh, even considering you heard me talk um, about public perception of rulemaking. This is in a different light, I believe, than uh, rulemaking on whether my dock is going to be uh, in or out of the water. <laughs> uh, so I like it. And if I may add, this, this doesn't even. Um, Municipalities still have, if, if they have um, flood hazard bylaws, which 90 plus percent of them do, um, it doesn't affect at all the local management through their own flood hazard bylaws decisions at the local level. This is to help the state identify where we have the highest priority critical floodplains and river corridors that because of their situation by um, protecting those, it only is going to benefit everyone downstream. Okay. Uh, and so, um, you know, there's some, depending on how you count, 21,000 river miles in the state of Vermont. And so this is by prioritizing the most critical, high priority river corridors is in this context. It ensures that we are focused on where we can make the greatest public 
safety benefit. Okay, so I actually just want to walk through what this actually does. I think we agree it's important and we're glad it's here, but let's talk about how it affects active 50 permitting today and then how it changes over time. You can help us do that. Sure. So, um, on or before November 1st, 2022, the Secretary, so the Secretary of A&R, shall adopt rules pursuant to the Administrative Procedures Act that designate the highest priority river corridors and establish requirements for the issuance and enforcement of permits applicable to uses located in highest priority river corridors. Highest priority river corridors are those that provide critical floodway, flood water storage and are, or are highly vulnerable to flood related erosion. Beginning on uh, November 2021, a person shall not commence construction of a development or subdivision that is subject to a permit under Act 250 without a permit issued pursuant to the rules required under subsection A of this section by the secretary or by a state agency delegated permitting authority under this section. I don't get the, is that referring to the rules above? <laughs> and the dates seem on, if so. Yep, I don't know. I, I don't know the answer to that question. So, so I, um, also, I, Mike Klein commented on this and sent pr proposed changes that I forwarded to you, and I'm on, I, I got, we could look at those, because they're under Mike, they address that. Um, sorry, so there is existing rulemaking authority under 754 sub A already. Um, oh, do you, do you happen to know? Would you like me to speak to this issue? Sure. Sure. Um, so what the proposal does is contemplate ex expanding an existing permitting program within the DEC Rivers program. That existing permitting program is authorized um, to promulgate rules and issue permits under that section. So I believe what this does, this is when you go onto this next page of the, the um, side by side, it's a new section of statute. And this just expands existing rulemaking authority to, to expand the permitting program. And those, those dates are the ones that um, are the kind of tiers of expansion that we've proposed with, in 2021, uh, the issuance of permits for any projects that are Act 250 jurisdictional in floodways or river corridors. And then um, by 2023, the issuance of permits for any development of it that, that are in these highest priority river corridors. So it's that, that, this is the section that expands the DEC program. How does it relate to the rulemaking in the number two of that? That I believe, on or before November 2022? Yeah. I believe that is where these highest priority river corridors would be established. So they're doing this kind of assessment right now. What this does is through rulemaking in 2022, they would define what the highest priority river corridors were. And then by 2023, they would expand their permitting program to address those areas. <coughs> and then how do those, how does this, does this then become another a &R permit that's considered under Act 250 review? Um, it would be for projects that trigger Act 250, yes. The idea is that it would be, it would be, enjoy the same rebuttal presumptions that Permits currently enjoy. Is there any estimate, Billy, as to how many uh, highest priority river corridors there are in the state? I don't know the answer to that. You could have the rivers folks come in and, and speak to that, but I don't know the answer. Really been defined yet. Really so the question that the, the chair asked was so then does this become Um, a uh, Act 
250 pounds. Trigger, I think is what it said. Uh, no. Would you ask? Would you ask it again? Because I don't think we got an answer that was adequate. I asked if this permit would be similar to other A and R permits yep. when a project triggers Act. When a project triggers Act 250. It's not going to increase the jurisdiction of Act 250. Right. It, except that in my mind, our projects that were in in. Um, In the, um, and now I've lost the, the phrase, the zones, the, the, well, uh, well, these river, door, river corridors are going to be con considered. So if a, a priority, um, darn it, I just said it about 10 minutes ago. <laughs> Enhanced resource areas. If a, in, in our bill, an enhanced resource area was going to be, a, if a project were there, is going to be a trigger for Critical. Act 250 jurisdiction. Is that accurate? Uh, river corridors would have been. And, and river corridors would have been. If you kept the enhanced river, if you kept rivers in, in the critical resource area. Right. And, and I'm lauding the fact that we're now not going to just say all rivers, but these particular parts, but they're still going to be considered enhanced resource areas. And so then I'm thinking that it's not simply an ANR permit. It's, it's a, an ANR permit that the uh, district commission or whomever Reviews bec um, because it is a, an enhanced resource area. Um, so I think that's something we've got to make sure we. we Do you mean critical resource area? Yeah. That's the one I mean. Yeah, yeah that one. I tried to whisper it to The old guy's deaf in one ear and the other. word is for the board. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I think it's going to end up being, and, and Billy is the intent to keep it in a critical resource area. Um, and then develop these rules for for how it would how projects would be developed, and then Act 250 would review these projects in light of being in a critical resource area <coughs> with a permit from the agency. No, that's not the intent. The intent is to do quite the opposite. Is to not is to not use river corridors as a jurisdictional trigger for Act 250 to regulate development within river corridors through a standalone DEC permit that looks at inundation and fluid well hazard risks and mm -hmm. not the whole scope of criteria that Act 250 considers. Well, I think that's quite revealing because um, I think our bill even though I've just said a little while ago, I support this, but I support this language in, in, in light of the fact that it is all happening in a critical resource area, which we want to protect. We now, with this language, really going to be condensing how many of these miles there are, but they're still critical, and they've been a and, and so I think we need to adjust that, uh, address it. I think we can do that in the wordsmithing, but uh, perhaps, um, uh, but I think, I think um, we, we accept this language with, with, with that flag or note that that conversation really needs to happen. Can I give a little bit of a background? Yes. Um, the reason why we're here today is because when we were, as you know, we have major restoration goals, restoring Lake Champlain, half the state, men from Magog, another 5%, Connecticut River, number 34, 37%. <coughs> uh, so it, wherever you stand, it's about 97% is under one of these large TMBLs, these large Clean Water Act driven initiatives. River, um, the river corridor, the, the, um, the river um, system itself represents a significant source of nutrients when they're unstable. And what we found when we were 
we being the state, delivering uh, restoration dollars to achieve our, our phosphorus reduction goals for the natural resource sector, that river sector. What we found is that we were um, not maximizing the benefit of that dollar spent. <coughs> we, were, we were more opportunity-based, restoring floodplains or, or protecting a restore, um, floodplain function when they, with the opportunity ar arose. At the same time, the Nature Conservancy, with a number of partners, including the state, were mapping <coughs> um, floodplains with the state to maximize ecological functions and benefits. All the co-benefits from flood protection, from habitat function, to um, uh, water quality, and then some. And what we found is we still weren't getting it right. We still weren't trying to maximize where can we achieve the greatest pollution reduction possible from the dollar spent for restoration efforts. And so it led to us, for, first of all, our first step was map all river corridors, and we have those maps. The next step was to prioritize through this process of identifying those highest, um, op highest valued opportunities for restoration protection. And that's where we are today, where we've, um, we're mapping those hot, or what's called the highest priority river corridors. That's to ensure that we can meet our TMDL targets while at the same time achieve flood resiliency and habitat function, but fundamentally river system natural stability. And so this whole approach was to recognize that, um, that we, the state, was willing to put together and stand up a whole pr separate permit program solely at this goal of trying to maximize um, the, the, um, the benefit to the public from both the permitting and the funding. And so this is why I, I see it as a, a great next step, because we don't have something like that. And this applies as not just in the Act 250 realm, this applies across the board um, across, and across the state. Hmm. Representative McCullough. Wow. I, I, I think it <laughs> is great. <laughs> but if it doesn't have anything to do with Act 250, what's it even in here for? Mm -hmm. and, and I think it does have everything to do with Act 250 because they are the critical resource areas that you mentioned that do need these protections. And, and um, the agency will establish all these rules and will be issuing permits and then those permits will be presented by the applicant to Act 250 to get their opinion on whether a project should happen there or not. And, and I appreciate your comments and your intent. Oh, this does nothing to the existing Criterion 1D, <coughs> which covers all the other river corridors. So it does nothing to that. What this is is a standalone mm -hmm. river corridor permit program to address yeah. the highest priority needs um, in lieu of the critical resource area designation of urban quarters. So you're still getting the protections of all 21,000 river miles of the state. This, but this, uh, uh, if um, Act 250 aside, I mean, just we already do that for any project the municipality is to uh, reach out to the state on. So this is something the state's doing now anyway. Basically, like you said, it's already underway. They're willing in the context of Act 250, instead of having river quarters in the context of Act 250 to be managed through a critical resource area. Is, is uh, Kelly, that, this is my understanding. I don't want to necessarily speak. Um, I will say two things. When development triggers Act 250 review, the comments the agency submits under Criteria 1D are consistent with this approach. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other thing I'll say is that the existing state flood hazard and river corridor permit program only applies to development that is exempt from municipal regulation. <coughs> that includes energy projects regulated by the PUC and certain state projects that don't go through municipal review. This proposal to expand that permit program to other forms of development is part of a compromise package to address concerns raised by this committee last year about river corridor protection. This compromise bill does not suggest expanding Act 250 jurisdiction based on the presence of river corridors. 
we're protecting river corridors by creating, setting up a permit program to address those specific impacts. Um, we're not offering to do that if it's going to, if Act 250 is going to apply to these areas as well. So I just want to make that very clear. This Thank is, a, it's an and or, it's an it's a or situation. Mm. Oh dear. <laughs> well, there's still a rebuttable presumption on criteria 1B, correct? Yes. Yep. So. And, and yeah. Thank you. So. Okay. Without clarification, um, committee, what is the preference? Well, w w w with that clarification, um, It, it really is good to know that, that this proposal really just doesn't want Act 250 to have any part in this. Then one might say, bring us another bill where you're going to do this. What, what's it doing in this bill? Or we put it in and say, this is our river corridor. These areas will become our critical resource waterway once identified, perhaps, we, um, but if we do that, uh, we may not get a lot of loving from the joint proposal. I have no idea, but um, I think it's still worthwhile keeping it in uh, because of its intrinsic value and, and then we need to push this whole idea around whether we want it to be part of our bill or not. I, you know, <laughs> this is a great conversation to have, so I appreciate that. Um, and I think we, we all are caring about the same thing. I think what this attempt is, a, is trying to accomplish is that if you have a parcel and that critical resource area ask piece of river quarter, that high quality river quarter is coming through your property, and you're develop, you're, you have a development that's outside that river quarter that the sheer fact that your parcel is being transected by that high quality river corridor might trigger you into Act 250. Now you have to de go through the criteria and demonstrate why your project is um, being designed in a thoughtful way. You're still pulled into, the, into Act 250. This is to say where it's solely focusing on making sure that river quarter is maintaining its integrity as it should, maintaining that highest quality condition or, rest or opportunity for restoring its full function for all the benefits we've described. Um, so I, I think um, I would say we should consider what our bill, I mean, the question before us is, is do we want to take accept the compromise which is trying which is trying to address our our concerns around rivers as a critical resource area um, or do we want to leave those in the critical resource model and we talked about this on page one where critical resources came up and here's an instance where they're coming up and do we think that river corridors should stay in um, is the critical resource area that we know that the, um, it, it, the Agency of Natural Resources, in fact, I think <laughs> it's fair to say, certainly the administration didn't support the critical resource area concept um, last year. And now they've offered this as a compromise. And so do we want to put this in and try it on? I think I would like to try it on. I mean, test great. test yep. drive it and yeah, see it. where that gets us. Under that. And, and I think that also then means taking out river corridors as a um, critical resource area. So. It might mean that um, if we're talking about all how many hundred miles? 21,000. 21,000 21, miles um, are gone. But no, they're still in. But, but the criteria 1D. No, they're not. Huh. So at any rate, yes, let's keep it in and, 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 and discuss mm -hmm. it. Uh, after we haven't had so much sugar. <laughs> I mean, for me, it was all in the form of berries, and I'm getting high over here. 
Okay, um, I think that's fabulous work for today. And um, I'm hoping we can pick up again with Ellen at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning, but she's currently scheduled with another committee. Um, so we'll, be, we'll see you back here at 9, and we'll keep going. Maybe it'll be with but anyway, let's do that. Thank you all. Yeah, good job, I say. So the out. I just to send you the mic fine language. It's on you. What was it up on the It's on it's I'm not sure why it was it's been it's almost it's up now. It's part of the Yeah, I don't know if you refer to this thing. This is better than the No, it's on. It's just on. So that's so that 